first wish goal. Torn apart for luck, a broken goal post is pro football symbol of triumph. In 1968, it symbolized more than triumph, for it marked the climax of a perfect championship. And this is number 78, Bubba Smith. On December 29th, Don Shula's Baltimore Colts met the Cleveland Browns for the NFL title. The Colts faced an anxious Browns team aware of Baltimore's super reputation, but not awed by the prospect of playing a team that had encountered defeat just once in 1968. Cleveland head coach Blanton Collier was just as nervous as his players. But twice before, he had destroyed the Colts' aura of invincibility with two stunning victories. In the 1964 championship, Don Shula watched Collier's Browns completely shackle the fabled John Unitas and his heavily favored Colts. After a scoreless first half, the Browns came back to crush Baltimore 27-0. had controlled almost the entire first quarter, but had not scored. 
and the sunburst of optimism was now replaced by a chilled glumness. Baltimore, on the other hand, was confident they had solved the mystery to the Cleveland attack, and certain their offense would prove irresistible to the Browns. So the confident Colts, led by their itinerant quarterback, Earl Morrow, began to assert their excellence. Morrow manipulated the impeccable Colt offense with a master touch that made him the NFL's most valuable player. Mixing short, accurate throws to his wide receivers with the flashing runs of setback Tom Matty, Morrow drove the Colts to their first score. The change of quarter did not affect Colt fortune, as Lou Michaels kicked Baltimore into a three to nothing lead. To the many who thought that Earl Morrow was a paper quarterback who would crumble in championship competition, the second quarter proved a shocking revelation. 81 comes just head, head of steam. Morrow produced Baltimore's first touchdown with a dazzling blend of offensive plays. He used tight end John Mackey first as a runner, then as a receiver. secondary to the outside with a pass to Jimmy Orr. Then tore their insides off with the blasting of Maddie and fullback Jerry Hill. Most pro football teams usually run to set up their passing. Morrow, however, used the reverse logic with handsome rewards, as Tom Maddy's touchdown made the score 10 to nothing. The rest of the first half saw both teams wander opportunity. First, safety Rick Volk, number 21, outdueled both Nelson and tight end Milt Morin, and made an interception that he ran back to the Cleveland 42. its chance to score when John Mackey fumbled in sight of the Cleveland goal, and Erich Barnes recovered for Cleveland. This play is worth reviewing again for two reasons. First, because Mackey and Morrill completely fooled the Browns with a rarely used tight end screen pass that almost resulted in a Baltimore touchdown. far more important, because had the Browns been able to convert Barnes's fumble recovery into points, they might have regained their waning confidence and changed the course of this championship. Unfortunately for the Browns, Mike Curtis intercepted Nelson's pass on the very next play and extinguished every hope Cleveland had of scoring in the first half. Once again, Morrill used the simple but brutal strategy of running Matty at Hill into the heart of the weary Browns' defense. It took only three plays to score, with Tom Matty scampering the last 12 yards for a touchdown. Time, the Colts left the field with a commanding 17 to nothing advantage, while Blanton Collier left with his game plan in a shambles. Second half, roll two. Cut it. Second half, jerk. The Browns would have to make up 17 points in the second half. In a regular season game, this is possible to do. But often in the tense atmosphere of a championship game, recklessness is substituted for patience. The 
third quarter revealed the Browns' team desperate for a score of any kind. And although they would be successful at first, it was this desperation that, in the end, would defeat them. Nelson directed a frenzied drive that combined the determined surges of Kelly and Haraway with an occasional pass. This strategy was rewarding as the Browns reached the Baltimore 33. And then a series of damning penalties lay waste to all their accomplishment. The penalty forced Blanton Collier to direct his quarterback to throw long passes to rescue the down. It was to be the Browns' final round, a brief feudal flurry before the knockout. only one weapon remained. But that too misfired. Cleveland would never have a chance to score again. The only question now was how large would be the Baltimore Colts' victory. Morrill exploited the Browns' defense with short, jabbing strokes of brilliance. Then he delivered the killing blow on a 38-yard strike to Willie Richardson. The pass was underthrown, but Richardson's timing was flawless, and he stole the ball away from Eric Barnes at the Brown five-yard line. Tom Matty dove over for his record-tying third touchdown of the game. Baltimore's lead grew to 24 to nothing. Cleveland's relapse became complete when quarterback Frank Ryan fumbled and the Colts recovered as the third quarter ended. The tired Brown defense received a momentary reprieve when John Mackey misplayed a sure moral touchdown pass. But Lou Michaels' second field goal made the score 27 to nothing. And at this point in the game, the Cleveland Browns became yesterday's heroes. After so many years of near misses, the Colts were finally getting rid of their frustrations. Their domination of the Cleveland Browns revealed nothing really new, just some familiar old strengths. For three quarters, their offense was almost flawless, while their defense was perfection. It was the cold defense that was the punishing influence through 14 league games. And it was the defense that severely mauled and laid open Brown wounds in this championship game. defense is founded on the delicate balance of youth and experience. This balance is best illustrated by the front four, where 36-year-old Ordell Bracy steady to Fred Miller, and where veteran Billy Ray Smith offset young giant Bubba Smith. The main focus of the Colts' defense was Cleveland quarterback Bill Nelson. The only real success Nelson had all day in penetrating the Colts' defense was on short throws to his setbacks. By denying Nelson the long pass, the Colts were able to converge on Kelly and Haraway before they were able to do any real damage. By flooding the passing lanes with his three M's and often both his setbacks, Nelson was guaranteed some prosperity. But this seeming advantage backfired because though Nelson had plenty of receivers, he did not have enough blockers to handle the Colts' blitz. 
This pressure forced Nelson to frantically abandon his preconceived plans and often forced him to throw too early or too late. Secondary preyed upon the bronze receivers and made timing between them and Nelson impossible. All this harassment led to drive killing interceptions, which helped lay the body to rest while the furious Colt rush buried it alive. his championship dreams crumbled under an avalanche of blue jerseys. The other target of the Colt defense was Leroy Kelly, the NFL's leading rusher in 1968. In Baltimore, Kelly had blistered their defenses and the Browns had won. Today, Kelly would manage just 28 yards on 13 carries. Cornerbacks refused him the outside routes. And a wise old linebacker like number 66, Don Shinnick, would push him back into the mixed master crush of the Baltimore pursuit. For an entire afternoon, the magic lightning of the Kelly machine was grounded. Shula, the performance of his offense was almost dissatisfying. For the first time in a championship, his offense was not led by John Unitas, whose crippled throwing arm reduced the NFL's all-time leading passer to a spectator. Though Unitas was forced to watch Earl Morrow direct the team on the field, he counseled him on the sideline with the wisdom that only comes from being through it all before. Give you a split on flight now, too. You can call the split. You can see the split, can't you? Yeah, yeah, pretty well, pretty well. Uh, let, me, let me see it. Uh, double wing. They do anything on double wing? Uh, they want the split. Well, you on got the, the one coverage on the, on the CR to Willie that one time. Yeah, yeah, that was early. Morrill responded to such guidance with a superior job of generalship. did not have an exceptional day passing, his very accurate throws made the Baltimore running attack a very formidable weapon. Whenever the Cleveland rush became too hot, he cooled it down with death draw plays to Tom Matty and Jerry Hill. Before the game, nobody talked much about the Colts' two setbacks. But in the end, it was their play that was to be the decisive factor and the springboard to victory. Jerry Hill, number 45, is a middleweight size fullback whose reputation for toughness before this game came more from his blocking than his running ability. But in this championship game, his savage thrust into the guts of the Cleveland defense not only accounted for 60 yards, but gain the respect of every Brown unfortunate enough to knock heads with the determined Wyoming cowboy. Like Hill, Tom Matty is a runner who thrives on and craves collision. Against the Browns, Matty was the game's leading rusher, and through the fourth quarter, he had scored every one of the cold touchdowns. Tom Matty paid the price for his violent style of running, but he always came back. 
ran even harder. Who got me? I like to know. Who, I know who got you there. It's back right here. Right here is where it hurts. The Cleveland Browns hurt Tom Matty, but Tom Matty hurt the Cleveland Browns much more. Don't get that on print, please. Over the gosh darn time. Just a moment, man. To dive over or to keep on running? I just dove over. It was the biggest hole you ever seen. You cannot measure Tom Maddy's work to the Colts by yards and touchdowns because he is their leader and his spirit infects every player, every coach. Is he broke? No, 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 it's a perfect. All right, that's cover, baby. Come on, Lou. Pick one off. I don't want to go, press. Come on, kill her, get him, baby. All right, all right, let's go. Come on, Boat, get after him, baby! Come on, Chitty, get him going! What do you say? Hey, hold it! Who's outside? Hey, Fritz! That was offensive pass in the first! Go, Mike! Go, Mike! Go, Mike! Go, Mike! Oh, God! Hey! Woo! Hey, Gary! These are the Baltimore Colts, a team of perfectionists who wanted one more touchdown before the final quarter and the game became history. Under the relaxed gaze of his coach, Earl Morrow led the Baltimore Colts to their last touchdown. When Timmy Brown tumbled into the end zone, it was all over. The championship drought was ended. There was time for emotion. There was a time of happiness. Time for a hero's smile from a proud old veteran. A tough young halfback. A championship quarterback. And a bright young coach. In almost dutiful respect, the stadium light shone on Baltimore's masterful Colts, and at 5.20 Eastern Standard Time, they walked off with their perfect championship. <laughs>